Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This evening's question time comes from an august institution in High Wycombe, the John Hamden School. I today am standing in for Mr. Dimbleby, who's still in a state of shock after being harangued by Nick and Nige. <laughs> this evening's panel, uh, starting with uh, Mr. Steve Baker on my right. He's a Conservative MP for High Wycombe, a former engineer in the RAF and described as a fizzy choice for the party. On my left is Mr. Chris Bryant, who is the MP for Rhonda and the Shadow Minister for Welfare Reform. Uh, he was the Minister for Europe in the last government and was Stonewall Politician of the Year in 2011 for his work campaigning for LGBT. Simon Strutt on the left is uh, a UKIP candidate for uh, Europe. Uh, and um, he is standing for the, in the European parliamentary elections. He has a glass of water and has left the beer with Nige. Charles uh, <laughs> uh, McDonough on my right uh, is a writer and a German historian uh, and a gastronome. Uh, to his right is Councillor Julia Wassell, who's been a Liberal Democrat uh, Bucks County Council representative since 1997. Uh, and that, ladies and gentlemen, is our uh, panel. Now, the first question is uh, from uh, Nathan Curley, who is a student. Nathan. Cheers. Um, uh, I'm, I'm looking to get a bit more informed about Scottish independence. And my question is, how is Scotland relevant to England at all? And why do you want to keep it so badly? Simon, would you like Scotland. to kick off? Scotland? Yeah. Um, uh, why is it relevant to us? Well, we, we have been the United Kingdom for many centuries, and uh, I think uh, we've got on generally pretty well together, a bit of antagonism here and there. Uh, it, it is up to Scotland to decide uh, whether they want to be independent or not, and it sounds like it's actually quite a close, a close race. I, I personally think that we are stronger together as a, as a nation, and I think the Scots should be very careful because without the pound and without being members of the European Union and with oil running out in about 10 years' time, if Are I you was... you the UKIP man, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> without membership of the European Union. I think they're going to feel very isolated was the point I was going to make. And uh, I think financially, bearing in mind that their welfare is, uh, is very expensive, um, they're going to be... Um, they, they should be very careful before they vote for independence. So Simon's vote there is, is, is for um, a federalist approach and a currency <laughs> union. Um, so Steve, surprise me. Uh, do the Conservatives now wish to uh, abandon the Scots? So we're always uh, keen to describe ourselves as a Conservative and Unionist party, and I think you've asked a really important question. Whenever this comes up uh, in Parliament, Nathan, I always say I think if you ask my constituents, they'd probably say uh, goodbye and good luck. But that's, I think sometimes, that's sort of the attitude of the jilted lover. I mean, the reality is that we've got a shared history, a shared culture, a single island nation, a shared queen. Um, we are really, to me, one nation. And I, I, you know, I love Scotland. I go there you know, as often as I've felt able. It's a beautiful place. We are one nation with one language and one culture. So I very much hope we stay uh, together. There's an enormous amount of devolution of power and I hope that a settlement can be found whereby we remain one nation. That said, even though I'm originally Cornish, and so I suppose a bit, uh, a bit of a Celt, they don't ask Buckinghamshire MPs to go up to Scotland to ask them to stay part of the UK. I can't think why. Giles, do you have a view on this? Well, I would dispute, I'd say that, you know, Scotland is, as far as I can see in terms of its relevance to England, no greater than France or Germany. Um, there was a period of rule by Stuart Kings, there was an act of union, of course. Unionist, I have to say, was the union uh, with Ireland and, the, and um, nothing to do with Scotland. Um, uh, language, well, the original language of Scotland is Gaelic, as my name is MacDonough, I am a, of Irish descent, uh, which is a, a language which bears a lot in common with the language spoken in the west of Ireland, and indeed in Cornwall, of course, largely died out, but has nothing in common with the English language. And I would actually say that one culture, that the Calvinist culture that dominates in Scotland, is much more remo remote from the culture of England 
than probably French or German culture. Julie. Well, yes, I'm uh, very keen to keep us united. Um, I think that um, Scotland has introduced some excellent policies with its devolution, which was one of the policies of the Labour Party. And uh, things like tuition fees and free nursing home care are working really well in Scotland. And it would worry me that if they separated, they wouldn't have sufficient income to do those, continue those kind of policies. So I think we've got it just right at the moment. Uh, plus, I'm a huge Andy Murray fan. I love tennis. And I don't think we could lose one of our greatest assets in that way. Also... If we separated, what would UKIP call themselves? Well, it would begin with W and end in K, so it's a bit worrying, really. Chris, while well, I work out what that could mean. <laughs> um, uh, well, I, th I think, first of all, that um, it is of interest to all of us in... in uh, I'm Welsh. Uh, well, actually, I'm part... My father's Welsh, my mother's Scottish... Um, and one of my grandparents was English, so my brother always used to say that he was half English, half Welsh, half Scottish, which made him one and a half. He wasn't very good at maths, but now he's a head teacher, so it's fine. Um, <laughs> and you don't need maths there, really. Uh, and uh, I think if you were to break us up, it would diminish our clout in the world. That's the most important thing that it would do. We would, we would no longer be one of the P5, permanent five members of the Security Council. Um, we... Uh, we would have a compromised border because Scotland pre presumably would operate in a different way. I don't know what you would call the country, um, England, Wales and Northern Ireland or something like that. It wouldn't be the United Kingdom anymore. Um, and, and actually, I think the bonds between the countries are far stronger than they are. But if I'm really honest, um, I have so little nationalism in me and I so dislike nationalism as a concept... Um, that I find it very difficult to get all that worked up about. But I do get worked up about by bad history from Conservatives. You were not always the Conservative and Unionist Party. You became the Conservative and Unionist Party when, uh, when Gladstone started going on about Home Rule for Ireland in the 1890s. It's not quite what I said. I was always said we were always keen to point out that we're the Conservative and Unionist but Party. But you weren't, because you were the Conservative Party long before you were the Conservative and Unionist Party. Well, it's certainly wrong. true. But day after day now on this subject, we're the Conservative and Unionist Party and we support the union. Yes, but that union is the wrong union. union with Ireland. Now, come on. <laughs> one at a time, one at a time. And, uh, and the Irish Free State has already come and gone and we've now got Ireland as a separate country. I'm very grateful for the history lesson. Good. Thank you. <laughs> I, think, I think I've worked out what the country's going to be called. It, it's uh, Northern Ireland, England and Wales, I think would be just new. Um, and I've got another point, actually, which is that because it, if they wanted to join the European Union, uh, they would they immediately have to join Schengen. So you'd have to have a border between England and Scotland, um, which would mean that if you wanted to go to a rugby match at Murrayfield, you'd have to take your passport, and I'm not in favour of that. Well, finally, Hadrian's Wall would come into its own. Now, what about the audience? Who wants to get rid of the Scots? Come on, let's... Uh... Ah, some, 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 who, who, who wants to join in the debate? L lady in the middle there, looking enthusiastic. It's, it's just a point, uh, following on from what you said, uh, the lady said, I'm sorry, I've forgotten your name. Um, you made the point that it would be sad for Scotland to lose, not be able to afford their benefits, like free prescriptions and free hospital parking or something like that. I don't find this a compelling argument to keep them. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, I saw some more hands. There's one over there. One young man over there with a white t shirt. I, think. Um, um, I was wondering because on the news they've been talking about um, its um, currency. Surely it shouldn't matter what the currency is called as long as, it, as, long as it's benefit, be benefiting Scotland. Uh, what, are, you, are you referring to Scotland having a new currency or are you assuming that the Scots would be able to negotiate to share the currency with us or do you not have a view? Um, well, my view is that why would they want to keep the pound if they're breaking away from the United Kingdom and surely they should just have a currency that benefits them the most and they should review their options again? Very sensible. 
So, Steve, what chance do you see of a, of a Scottish, a Scottish whatever it's going to be called, Haglet? Well, I mean, Great. bear in mind that Scottish banks do still in, uh, issue their own banknotes, which is a legacy of the old Scottish free banking system, where there was competitive note issue amongst uh, the Scottish banks, and it was, according to some historians, uh, one of the best banking systems there's ever been. So, um, this it, from the country that bought us RBS and Bank well, of indeed, Scotland. Yeah, it's, it, <laughs> of course, <laughs> it's interesting to see how far they've fallen. But I yeah. think the gentleman there makes a really good point. If uh, if Scotland wants independence, I mean, do they not want proper independence? You know, in other words, they, why should they have the pound? Why do they want the Queen? Do they want our defence services? If they're independent, they should be properly independent. Should we move on to, um, to question two? Let's move on to question two, which is from David Willis, who uh, is the father of a student. Indeed, and uh, John Hamden, old boy as well. And, uh, when were you here? Uh, oh, the late 70s. So was I. <laughs> no. we'll, uh, we'll have to, uh, just saying <laughs> we'll have to have a chat later uh, my question is on Europe and uh, what I'm interested to know is the panel's views on whether the government can make any realistic and meaningful negotiations uh, with Europe ahead of the 2017 referendum I'm going to start this one with Steve because it's uh, your government's policy that, that they are intending to renegotiate what chance well, I'm very happy to support David Cameron's policy. I think it's the right policy, and I've worked pretty hard, as my voting record shows, to secure that policy, so I'm going to support it. Um, I actually don't think that there's very much chance of a meaningful return of powers. I think Angela Merkel made it pretty clear we could have whatever we wanted, as long as it was no powers back. Um, and I think we will end up having a referendum which is on broadly the current settlement um, or exit. Um, the that the worst thing that could happen would, would, would be if a failed negotiation was presented as a success and then we were asked and campaigning as a party to vote for it. So um, I'll be watching very closely um, uh, how it goes. What I would say is rather like the Scottish question, what really matters is that we get a say over who governs us ultimately. Because right now, as far as I'm concerned, we live in a country called Europe. A lot of the scenery is still in place that makes us look like a sovereign nation but we are not a sovereign nation. In so many ways, we're not a sovereign nation. It's true, we've still got a crown prerogative power about going to war, but in so many ways, we're not sovereign. So the public must have a choice, and the great thing about having a referendum is that in that referendum, your vote and my vote, Chris's vote, will all be equal. And I am very much looking forward to that day. I got into politics over many things, but first and foremost, I was absolutely furious about the Lisbon Treaty and the way it was hammered through trampling democracy. I did not join the Royal Air Force just so that we could surrender to a foreign superstate. Now, love the peoples of Europe, but we should have a say about whether or not we're governed in common by an elite overseas. I, I, I take it when you say you're, you don't want to be governed by a foreign superstate, you didn't have Putin in mind. At the moment, he's, he's only over at the Ukraine. Um, well, I think um, b before I come on to you, Simon, I'm going to get some of the other views, because obviously I appreciate this is very much uh, your field, but I thought the next person I would turn to is uh, Julie. Um, you, you obviously uh, saw and heard the debate last night in which your leader was accused of being a liar for coming out with what appeared to be wholly accurate facts. Oh, I'm not supposed to have a view. Um, where do you stand on this? Well, I'm deeply committed to staying in Europe, and that's certainly not just because it's our party line. I've always believed in being in Europe, and um, when I was at Wickham High School uh, a few years ago now, there was a discussion about the common market, and generally we girls were very keen to be part of being in Europe. Uh, we like town twinning. We like going over there shopping. We like the um, opportunity to have employment in Europe. Uh, I'm a mental health worker by background, and I love the idea that I could go and work in most countries in Europe and have a different experience, particularly Slovenia. Um, I've enjoyed the debates. I think they're vitally important to stimulate um, thinking and discussion ahead of the European elections. I think the European elections tend to be a bit of a dead duck. There's a very low turnout. People don't fully understand the voting system. And I admire Nigel and Nick for getting up there, standing up, 
arguing with each other, pulling in a large television audience and getting this in-out uh, debate running. And I think, frankly, David Cameron and Ed Miliband have been cowardly out of the wings. They could have been fully uh, involved with this and they've left it to these two men who have shown up as quite good personalities. I mean, I'm not keen on you, Kip. Not at all. Uh, and I hope to land a few punches as the only woman on the panel later on. A few punches on you, Kip. But I think they've, they've been good role models for politicians and a lot of people have enjoyed the debates and learned from it. And good but luck you, to them. Do you think that if David Cameron was saving his energy for the renegotiation, it might go a bit better? Well, I think, um, you know, that... Uh, these MPs, they're, they're not spending as much time as the, in the House of Commons as they should be. They've got plenty of time to be out and about publicising their views. And I think they've, um, you know, there's always compromise for grown-ups if we want to be grown-up and we want to be in Europe and we want to be uh, standing with other nations, tall and proud then there's always going to be compromise and renegotiation. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I don't think we should make it into such a big issue. The referendum does worry me, because I think it's populist at the moment to say come out of Europe, just as if we said, bring back hanging, well, we might have over 50% vote for it if there's been a sensationalist case. So I'm not keen on this single-issue politics, really, gaining momentum, and uh, I hope to see Nigel Farage and his completely unknown army heavily defeated at the European elections. So, Chris, um, an MP who at this point is not sitting in Parliament, um, as in physically now, um, what, what do you so think? There's no point in being there now. <laughs> it's How finished for the day. Absolutely. How realistic do you think it is uh, that we can renegotiate the deal? I think there will be no new treaty before 2017. I predict there will be no new treaty. So all the stuff about treaty negotiation is tosh, I'm afraid, um, from a Conservative leader who's very weak. He's governed by people like Steve Baker, and that's bad for the Conservative Party because in the end, the leader should be able to lead in the national interest rather than always looking to um, their party backbenches. Um, but I, and the reason there won't be treated renegotiation is because some countries in Europe, if, because everybody has an equal say, everybody has a veto on whether you even start the treaty renegotiation process, 28 countries in total, four of those countries by law have to have a referendum if they're going to have a new treaty, not on in or out, but whether that treaty should go forward. So in all of that, I just don't see that, um, that there's going to be change. But, there are things I'd love to change about Europe. I think the common agricultural policy is um, immoral in many ways. And I've said this many, many times before. I said it when I was Europe Minister. Um, because it basically means that European farmers, including a lot of farmers in Buckinghamshire, incidentally, um, are paid large amounts of taxpayers' money, which means that um, farmers in Africa and Latin America can't compete. And that's immoral, wrong and unfair, and we should change it. But let's never be naive. If there wasn't a common agricultural policy, there'd be a French agricultural policy, an Italian agricultural policy, a German one, and doubtless a British one, all of which would be immeasurably worse. So in the end, I do believe in pooling sovereignty. You've only got to look at the issue in the Ukraine and the way that Putin is flexing his muscles at the moment. Um, you may think Ukraine's a very long way away, but actually, uh, and we're lucky in the UK that we don't rely on Russian energy very much, but Lithuania... Um, Latvia, Germany re rely much more heavily on Russian energy and that's where if all the countries of Europe work together around a shared um, foreign policy in relation to Russia, I think we stand a chance of seeing them off. Otherwise, we're into the territory of the 1930s, which is just appeasing um, physical aggression. And I think we stand far better if we're all together. There's one other thing that I think, you know, some people say that it was okay when Europe was just about a market, if we could just go back to it being a shared market. But I want to say, markets and politics, I, I entered politics because I believe the two belong together. I actually want to use politics to make the market work for humanity rather than the other way around. Um, so, for instance, um, you know, mobile phone companies 
have for years been charging people ludicrous amounts of money when they go outside their own national country um, for phone ro roaming. It's only because of the Euro European Commission that from December 2015 you will never be charged again for using your British mobile phone in France or Germany or elsewhere within the Union. That's the kind of thing the Commission should be focused on, making sure that the market works for everybody rather um, than the other way around. And one final point, which is about um, immigration, because I think often people think that UKIP is primarily about Europe. I would say it's not. So I think often UKIP's, um, a lot of the people who talk to me that say that they're thinking of voting UKIP, it's about migration issues. But I just want to say to people, which is the country, or ask a question, which is the country in Europe that has most of nationals living elsewhere in Europe. It's the United Kingdom, by far and away. And it's not just rich British people retiring to live in Spain, or for that matter, poor um, British people retiring to live in Spain and using the Spanish NHS without never having contributed to it. It's also British people doing business in Europe. If we were to leave the European Union, we would be cutting off our nose to spite our face. And Giles, uh, you, you are a historian, and yes. to a certain extent, uh, we have forgotten, haven't we, the uh, role that uh, the EU has played in avoiding wars in Europe in the last years since the Second World War. I can't think of a period of this length where we haven't seen a war in Central and Western Europe. I would challenge the audience to bring one up. Um, I would also okay. say that... Um, the European Union in its foundation with the Treaty of Paris was always a political grouping and they never made any bones about the fact that it was meant to be a political grouping. So I think that is just basically wrong. No one surprised uh, the constituent parts of the European Union by saying, hey boys, we're suddenly we're political. It was political from the start. So this should not be a surprise to anyone. Um, so yes, um, we have, uh, through one thing or another, and probably the European Union, European Union preserved peace in this uh, Europe uh, since the Second World War, which is no mean achievement. Mark, if I may. So, yes, yes, please, uh, Steve. You might remember that the Spanish rattled sabres at Gibraltar. Well, we all had to pile into the chamber as members, members of Parliament and sit there making all the right noises to make sure that Spain was in no doubt whatsoever that we would defend Gibraltar. That was the hidden meaning of what was going on. Why? Because we remember the Falklands and that because we didn't go and show that we would positively defend the Falklands, it was invaded. And th the truth is that although these, think these things are claimed for the EU, they failed even to stop the Spanish rattling sabres at Gibraltar. So utter, a lot utter tripe. <laughs> well, sorry, but I, I, mean, I, I was Europe Minister for, for about five minutes and in those five minutes... <laughs> We, there, there was a Gibraltar issue that cropped up like every week and it was always something silly. Um, we were fortunate because at the time there was a socialist government in Spain and they don't worry so much about Gibraltar, not like the Conservatives who have a bit of Franco past in, within the party. Um, but honestly, it was the easiest thing in the world to calm debates down with Spain about Gibraltar. And actually, I think it's one of the things that this government has done particularly poorly. Hague should, some, Hague should never have been involved. It should have been a junior minister ringing up the junior minister in Spain and saying, hola, um, <laughs> yeah, hola. I mean, I can speak Spanish, but I'm not going to show off. Um, <laughs> uh, can't we just kind of sort this out? Honestly, when, when every, and all the Tories came in the chamber to do all that stuff about Gibraltar, it was embarrassing. Embarrassing and made it much, much worse. Well, I'd like to say that uh, it's time that we women stood up and uh, said no more war. This jingoistic, sabre-rattling nonsense must stop. Uh, we must say to men, we don't want you joining the army, we don't want you going to war, we need a gradual disarmament of nuclear weapons and all uh, military installations, and in fact nobody in the world, in my view, needs a gun. Give them an air pistol, okay, but not a gun, maybe well, a catapult. And, um, you know, yeah. to to think that we're going on and on to judge things by how many wars we have. We've got to introduce more and more mediation, get people sat down, 
stay in the European Union and make sure we don't allow anything to escalate into war again. And we'll okay, to... let, let's, um, let's, let's not go too far off, Beast. Um, of course, there have never been women taking this country to war. Um, <laughs> so uh, we'll, uh, uh, we'll, we'll just move over to Simon. It is your moment. The, uh... I'm not going to go on much about this, but yeah, Europe is my subject being, uh, being from UKIP. Um, Sovereignty. We've talked a bit about sovereignty. Maybe we're pooling sovereignty. Maybe sovereignty is a good thing to pool with the other 27 countries of the European Union. Well, maybe it is and maybe it's not. But that sovereignty comes from the electorate. And the electorate haven't had any input on this in 40 years. 40 years ago, we voted to join the common market. And it, it, we did think it was different. We didn't think we were joining something which was to do with a, a, some sort of gradual move towards federalism. We thought we were joining a, a sensible trading bloc. So 40 years later, you, the electorate, have not, not had a go at uh, of, of, of having some input on where you want your sovereignty to land. Now, I actually agree with Steve when he says that um, negotiation is going to be pretty tricky. Uh, the idea that we're going to be able to renegotiate with, the, with all 28 countries between now and 2017, is it, that David Cameron's got in mind? The idea that we're going to be able to do some sort of deal, Angela Merkel is being terribly polite, but really there isn't much chance of a great deal of movement. And what should have happened is that we should have had a referendum when the Lisbon Treaty was going through. Because as Steve himself has said, it's a, it was a, an angry moment, really, when even Nick Clegg said that we should be having a referendum at that point although he seems to have gone off the idea now, we've ended up with the Lisbon Treaty, which says that we all agree to ever closer union with the other countries of Europe. Um, most, most polls, you see, suggest that people across Europe, about 10% of people want ever closer union. The other 90% want something less than ever closer union. And it is shameful that the people of Europe really haven't had a say in all that time. Uh, so we are looking at a, a broadly unelected operation in Brussels, driving us towards ever closer union. They're well motivated. They think it is going to give us peace in our time, but we have had quite a lot of peace, and I suspect that peace would continue. Um, so I, I'm strongly in favour of a, of a referendum, um, and I, I will personally be voting for leaving Europe. I think we should be able to control our own borders, I think with well, as the sixth. I interrupt, so none no, of us, no, not none for of the us moment. Mind if you do leave Europe, you <laughs> can leave Europe tonight. None of us mind if you want to leave Europe. No, I'm. Uh, uh, no, no. I think that's slightly. Is that not a little bit arrogant? Should we? Ju leave Julie, Europe? that's a little bit personal. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Shouldn't we allow the electorate decide whether we leave, rather than me or you or anybody on the stage? Um, but uh, but I'll be voting against um, staying in Europe. I'll be. I, I believe in uh, this, this nation. We're the sixth largest economy in the world. We can do our own trade deals. We can still trade with Europe as Switzerland does. Switzerland is not a, an EU country. We can manage our own legislation and we can decide what to do with our own borders. It's perfectly legitimate. Australia do that. America do that. Loads of different countries do that. Um, so to answer your question, are we going to be able to have a negotiation with Europe? The answer is Really, we're not. And what we should do is we should go straight through and have a referendum as soon as possible. So, Simon, before, before I open it up to the audience, there's just um, a couple of questions that I, I just wanted to explore with you. Um, as I understand it, uh, your major point is that you believe that anyone who rules us should be democratically elected. <laughs> There's I think there's a trick here. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, uh, uh, as a party, UKIP believes in democracy. Do you not believe in democracy? Uh, so, how do you square that with the party's support for unelected bishops in the House of Lords? <laughs> unelected bishops. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Let's face it. UKIP want their cake and eat it. They want yeah. Nigel Farage and his merry men drawing their allowances in. Europe, stashing up their coffers so they can run an election. Uh, Do you know one of the advantages of, of cross examining witnesses in court is <laughs> that the jury don't suddenly jump up and interrupt? Hey. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> uh, so I, was, I was just wondering, Simon, if you were aware of the rather amusing fact that the only other country in the world where you have unelected clergy running the place happens to be uh, Iran. 
<laughs> well, you could say that Vatican City is fairly controlled by the clergy. Right? <laughs> good point, good point. A strong influence, yeah. And then again, that's probably only one man. Um, now, the audience. Until women popes, yeah. Until we get to women popes. Uh, right, there's a, there's a question over there for a lady in the fourth, fifth, sixth row. Uh, man, actually. <laughs> You is well needing a haircut. <laughs> Do you actually think that Britain has the ability to uh, remain both influential and independent as we move towards the future? For you. I didn't catch that. Can you say oh, that again? Do we believe that we can be both uh, influential and independent? as we go into the future. So this is presumably uh, Britain uh, moving away on its own with absent Europe, hopefully still with Scotland. It would be even worse if we've got Scotland disappearing off as well. Well, with, with the sixth largest economy in the world, I don't know why we have to cleave to our neighbours in Europe to give us some sort of clout around the, the table around the world. The world is moving closer to free trade. We're in a perfectly good position to negotiate our own deals, as Switzerland does, as Canada does, as... Uh, 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 Australia, New Zealand, we're bigger than these countries. Um, they're, they're all great trading nations. Look at Singapore, it's a fantastic trading nation, much smaller than us, but it still manages to make sure that things operate in their favour. Um, so the answer is uh, yes, absolutely. We but, should have but, more confidence in ourselves. I think. But it seems to me that Switzerland and Norway, the two countries that you've cited as a, as a great example of, of where Britain could be, yes, are, are the worst of all possible examples. Because... Norway? because all right, well, let's just stick with Switzerland. But Switzerland, Switzerland doesn't get to write it own, its own rules. If it wants to trade with the EU, it has to abide by all the rules that are written by the 28 members sitting around the table, and Switzerland is not sitting at the table. So, basically, we would have all the rules written by 27 countries who have just experienced us storming out of um, the membership of that club. Can now, I just think that's a bad idea. Can I just make it? No. Right. Right. And, right. and I've got a second point. Can I've got I, a second I, point, which is an Jeremy, even better can I, point. Can I reply to the first oh. point first? Cool. Can I do the second point first, because otherwise I'll forget it. <laughs> <laughs> we might um, we're getting old. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, and my second point is, if you go to countries like Singapore and China and India and um, Brazil, they all go, we don't want to deal with 27, 28 different countries, one by one by one. We want to know that we're dealing with one single set of laws. There's one set of rules that govern the market across all of that. So my anxiety is, I completely agree with you, we need to trade more around the rest of the world, but the best way of doing that for, for the United Kingdom is through the European Union, not outside it. OK, okay. Well, can Steve? I come back on that? Because After S Steve, you had a point we, that I mean, you wished to make? The, an the answer to your <laughs> question you is, yes, we can certainly be independent, and let me explain why. One of the things that's going on at the moment is something called the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, and people are writing to me about it. Some fear it will lead to excess deregulation, what I fear is it will lead to raising all this product harmonisation and market rules to a transatlantic level, which will be even less accountable to the public. One of the great joys of markets is that they produce diversity and experimentation and progress. And one of the problems, therefore, of raising <coughs> these rules to an ever higher level and actually entrenching them so they're ever more difficult to change by elected politicians, and I do see it often, one of the problems with that is it gets rid of the diversity and the spontaneity and the innovation which allows us to progress as a civilization. And finally then, with all that in mind, international economic integration did not begin with the European Union. Unfortunately, it was ended by two world wars, or largely it wasn't quite ended, but it was very substantially diminished. I just picked up an old book by a guy called Wilhelm Röpke about international economic disintegration. Free trade without supranational regulations worked extremely well prior to the two world wars. And over a course of 50 years, the world suffered an ideological revolution. And that what it's left us with is this, that the European Union is the symptom of a problem. It is not itself the, the problem. And the problem is this, that there's a belief everywhere in the omnipotence of political power. And I believe it's not omnipotent. We each of us have to choose to do the right thing, whether we're in business or in our personal relations. And actually, raising these rules to a, a transatlantic scale, a pan-European scale, will not help us to improve as a society. I, 
I, I don't believe we can remain influential if we become independent. I think that we have a tendency as an island to become isolationist, and I think the reality is that then we would become paranoid and suspicious. We need to be out there in Europe having our share of the market, keeping all these jobs that are dependent on the European Union. Just look at Hyundai in High Wycombe. It's, it's international headquarters based in the London Road. Many other car manufacturers and other headquarters have said they won't stay in the UK if we come out of, um, if we come out of Europe. No, we wouldn't be influential. We would become isolated, suspicious, and probably quite paranoid and start getting on our warships again. Do you know, I'm, I'm, I'm quite a fan of big companies because they provide us with a lot of stuff that we all use every day. I mean, there's a Parker Pen for a start. It's a big firm. But do we really want to be ruled by what big firms want governments to do? Because there's often uh, complaints about lobbying scandals. But do you really want large corporations determining what the rules are? Or do you want elected politicians you can get rid of to determine them? I want you to be able to get rid of your elected politicians. I want you to be able to say, Steve, that rule isn't good enough, change it. And if I can't, if I won't, get rid of me. Right, well, we at don't the moment, live in that world. <coughs> sorry, I was just uh, appreciating that we're still debating uh, whether we can renegotiate the deal with Europe. Uh, and I think uh, that we've gone so far off piece that Michael Schumacher uh, would be looking in amazement at us. Um, there's one gentleman there who wants... Uh, I am a huge Schumacher fan before you all get upset, and uh, nothing I wish more than his complete recovery. Gentleman there in the second row. John Strafford. Chairman, uh, um, you raised the issue of democracy, but the European Union is wholly undemocratic, with a European Commission that is unelected by and unaccountable to the people, with the uh, European Council, the only legislative body in the world other than North Korea that meets in secret, and a European Parliament where the electors cannot choose their representative, they have to choose a party, and where a vote in Luxembourg is worth five times that a vote of the United Kingdom. So what are the panel going to do about democracy in Europe? Can I answer that? We're going to get out of Yes, we're going to have... <laughs> I'm, I'm only going to have two more... Okay, well, you're now. absolutely you too. right. We should get out of Europe because we, we respect democracy and democracy is important. Um, uh, Chris made a point about Switzerland. I mean, Switzerland is a, is a highly democratic um, uh, country. It trades per head of the population something like four times as much as we do with, with Europe in terms of exports to Europe. And it does actually pick and choose European legislation. It's not part of the common agricultural policy, for example. So, um, so but I completely agree with you that the, the way to avoid that undemocratic organisation is not to be a part of it. Chris, last on this point. Look, the truth is that Europe is, it, it's a fudge. It's, it, it, it's trying to pool sovereignty between member states, between 28 different countries who have legitimately elected governments. I think there are things you could do to enhance some of the demo democratic elements in, within it, but some of those then tip over more into the area of creating a single state. So I suppose theoretically you could elect a single president of the European Commission. Every voter in Europe has a vote. But the danger is then that person has a mandate which, uh, which you know, com would completely oppose uh, whatever happened in each of the member states. So I'm not sure that that's the answer. I, I do, however, sometimes worry a bit about British attitudes to democracy because we seem to forget um, that uh, the House of Lords is totally unelected. Um, it's not just the bishops. Uh, in fact, all the, uh, and now we have a wholly appointed House of Lords. I lie. There are 92 hereditary peers who are elected in a very bizarre system that still survives. Um, but the vast majority, 800, making us the largest legislature apart from the, Chinese, the People's Assembly of China, um, and so, and sometimes I just think we need to be a bit more humble about our own democratic experiences. And actually, you know, I know I'm a wonderful, gorgeous, warm-hearted person, but the people of the Ronda don't vote for me in the main to be the MP because of me. They vote for me because they want a Labour MP and they want a Labour government. And, and that requires a degree, for me, I think, of humility about how I approach my politics. Right, well, we need to move on to the next question, so I'm sorry for those of you who are going to have to save them up for the next question. comes from Joe Longman, who is a student. Joe. Yeah, my question is this. Um, 
Considering that more than half of the cabinet are privately educated, does the government provide a fair representation of the average voter? And I'd like to take this question quite quickly, and I'm going to start Julie. Well, um, there's a lot that needs to be done in our politics about getting uh, better representation for women, better representation for black and minority ethnic groups, and the private education system is unequal, so people are given education advantage, like the grammar school system. Uh, many people who attend the grammar schools in Buckinghamshire are privately educated at their primary school and they have an advantage. So, of course, I want to see more diversity in politics. Look at it tonight. I'm one woman on the panel and I'm just a shoe in for some, another woman that couldn't turn up. And if I butt in, I'm a nuisance. But if men speaking, they've got gravitas. We need to change attitudes towards politics and we must get more young people in. We must reduce the age of voting to 16, the age of driving to 16. We must empower young people, acknowledge their other responsibilities and get more young people into politics as well. <clears throat> Private or public schools, that's what we're talking about. Um, Giles. I don't know very strong view on this. I mean, I notice an awful lot of Tosh has talked about the cabinet. You know, we've talked about the Etonians in the cabinet. There's one Etonian in the cabinet, isn't there? That's the Prime Minister. Um, it's half public school, as far as I can see. Um, the rest is not. There's one. Nine, I think. No, in the cabinet. George Young, for a start. No, he's um, a Pauliner. He's his and George Paul. Osborne's a Pauliner. George, uh, George Young. Is he a member of the cabinet? Yeah. So that's two. Find me another one. Oh, uh, Owen Patterson. I mean, uh, uh, anyway... <laughs> I'm not meant to be Let's not in. pick on Eaton. <laughs> Poor lines are just as bad. They're just as bad. But uh, as far as I can see, there's an awful lot of... If you went back to Mr Heath's administration, and he was not an Etonian but a, a grammar school boy, you would find a hell of a lot of more Etonians in government. And in, I think if you went to Mrs Thatcher's cabinet, you'd find a hell of a lot more Etonians in her cabinet. In fact, his government, and I'm not sticking up for Eton, I'm not an old Etonian, is, is far less public school than the last Conservative administration. Simon. Well, I think the cabinet should, um, should be full of the best educated people in the country. Yeah, and at the moment, it would appear that that is people who went to private school, which is a scandal, which is a scandal. Because if you look back, you find, OK, we've got an Etonian in charge at the moment. Um, well, Heath, we have grammar school, is that right? Thatcher grammar school? Uh, Wilson grammar school? I think yes. I'm right. So if yes. you go back 40 years, the best educated people came out of grammar schools. And that means that with grammar schools you get social mobility. And so, uh, I mean, UKIP have always been in favour of grammar schools. We should have more of them. But UKIP, shouldn't every school be a grammar school? Shouldn't every school be of the standard of a grammar school? Yeah. And shouldn't yeah. everybody have the same chance? Yeah, do you remember, do you remember so education? So have a selection education, work in that process. I'm on the county council. I'm fighting to narrow the gap so that every child in Bucks has an equal opportunity. They don't at the moment. At the yeah. primary school I represent, only two children pass the 11 plus. Yeah. In Beaconsfield, it's 90%. Everyone should have the same chance, but I'm being a bit more realistic, I think, in terms of the fact that, you know, if, if the best people get to the top, you then... you want to go back to the 1950s? That's we have great social want. mobility That's through grammar schools, and uh, I think we're, we're let's keep it to gra let's keep it to the grammar public debate. I don't want to. This is a short question. This one, Chris. Uh, I was taught a very simple thing by my parents, which was that you shouldn't judge somebody according to the colour of their skin, um, whether they're male or female, what accent they've got, or frankly, what school they went to. Yeah, End yeah. of story. I'm afraid. Yeah. See. It's lovely to be able to agree with Chris for the first time. Now, <laughs> speaking... Damn, I've got to withdraw it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good luck. I'll quote you if you do. Now, I speak as an old boy of Polter Comprehensive, uh, the son of a uh, carpenter. Uh, stepfather was an open-cast mine worker. And I tell you what I believe in after being elected to Parliament two, two and a half years after joining the Conservative Party. I believe in meritocracy. 
Now, one of the things that I find today, this, although I would, I would dearly love to see more women and more ethnic minorities in Parliament and in government, but one of the things I find now is that because I'm a straight white male, I'm going to be positively disadvantaged. So I do agree with what Chris said, but I tell you, when I had my first interview on this process to being here today, I was told when I was interviewed, you won't get anywhere, you're a straight white male. Now, really, I want to live in the world, actually, that Chris just indicated in that snapshot, where we don't judge people based on their gender, their ethnicity, their religion, their sexuality, all the rest of it, where actually we're all equal before the law, and the best people get on and achieve absolutely all that they can in the service of others. So I believe in meritocracy. I think that democracies get the representatives that they choose. That's the point of democracy. And I would encourage you all, whatever your political inclination, to join a political party because all of them have memberships which are way too low, way too narrow, and we just must have more people in political parties. We need them. We, we must have parties, because you have to marshal people and get them through either the I lobby or the no lobby. You have to have parties. Please join the party of your choice. I don't really care which one it is. If you're a Conservative, please join the Conservative Party. What was this a please? recruitment what drive? <laughs> yeah. You've forgotten the union already. But please join a political party and participate at least in choosing <laughs> your candidates. Can I just interrupt this part of political broadcast by the Conservative Party and Unionist Party? Sorry. The, the one thing I do worry, though, is that I think Parliament is out of cult kilter with the country. It doesn't look like Britain at the moment in so many different regards. Um, and in fact, I, and I, I partly blame my party as well because I think there are, I went to a public school as it happens, but I, d I don't think that um, there, are, there are many fewer now working class MPs. And I think that that narrows the breadth of experience that is brought to debates in Parliament. And I think we can only, we, we need to improve that. Uh, it's also true, Julia is right about the number of women MPs. It's pretty disgraceful that we still have so few. I know I'm not supposed to be uh, taking any views on anything, but one of the uh, thoughts that I always have in relation to this is it was early, I think, in the uh, 20th century that we introduced payment for MPs so that the working class could come and be MPs. And we've now got ourselves into the most absurd position where we pay MPs an absolute pittance and we still expect to have people who can't... It is a pins who, 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 who we expect to come and do an incredibly difficult job. And it's only if you've got other income that you can truly afford it. So what do we expect? Now, questions from the audience. Yes, a uh, chap over there who tried on the last question. backtracking a little bit, but there has been a lot of talk about democracy um, tonight, um, but can we really call the UK a democracy where we effectively only vote for one MP? Well, I mean, yes, I mean, it's first past the post system. That's what was settled on in the referendum that we just had on it. And I think the answer is yes. But I have to tell you, I should Google the uh, Yes Prime Minister episode on this because it's a glorious thing. If you want to find it, you can find, you'll see it on my website. I just posted it up there this morning. We have got a British democracy and it's a glorious fudge. But um, yeah, we, the country just chose first past the post when it was offered AV as an alternative. Um, and that question, I suggest, has been settled for quite a long time. I'd like to say that I think as we're stuck with one MP, it should be able to be a job share. If it had been a job share, I would have been an MP a long time ago because I could have uh, adjusted my way of life to doing the constituency work while somebody else went and sat on the green benches or wherever. What colour is it? That's not really, well, that's not really the point, is it? Your work in the constituency should inform what you say and do in the chamber. Yeah, I mean, but it could be interchangeable and there could be more management. So you could have two MPs for the price of one. If you vote for my policy, job share, please. But you'd have to vote for, vote for both of them, would you? You'd, sort well, of, stand you'd, you'd stand a joint, as a duo. So. stand on a joint platform, why not? I mean, why? interestingly, for a lot of uh, history, we, uh, most constituencies did have two members and sometimes they would return yeah, two different job people. Um, 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 Wickham, chipping Wickham, as it used to be called for a long time, had two uh, members of Parliament. Um, and, and also, Mark, I hate to tell you, but you're wrong. Um, MPs what? were paid from 1258 onwards for a long time um, until Andrew Marvell. He was reckoned to be the last one paid in the old system. And, when, and Pepys thought that when the abolition of, of MPs' pay came in in the late 17th century that it was a real problem. 
because it just meant that rich people could do it. But interestingly, when the first pay was introduced in 1258, the, key, the king was so keen to have really good people that he paid four shillings a day, which was twice what they'd be paid for if they, it paid if they went to war on his behalf. Excellent. But it was reintroduced, wasn't it, in the early 20th and century? Was, and then it was brought back as a deal between Labour okay. and Liberals in 1911, yes. OK, good, as long as I'm not going too, too mad. Um, young lady here. Oh, sorry. Is, it, is it a man? <laughs> Please tell me you're not a man. <laughs> um. he, he said that to so many people before. <laughs> Chris and I have a little secret. Um, you should have stopped while you were ahead. Um, if, if you would like our democracy to be meritocracy, then surely we should have people in positions of authority who, have, who are experts in their field. For example, um, a Secretary of State for Education who has more experience in education than simply going to school. <laughs> Chris. I don't think I shouldn't answer that, because I basically say, yes, Tristram Hunt will be quite a good Secretary of State for Education. <laughs> Um, may, I, may I answer the point, Mark? Oh, yes, I mean, no, please, I think Steve. it's a very interesting point. I mean, personally, I would like to get politicians out of education and let teachers who know what they're doing get on with it, rather than ending up with the whole education system. Say we only had teachers in as Secretary of State. I would not want us, the whole education system, to just be moulded to that one person's point of view. I would like schools to go off and do different things so that we can see what works best and make the fastest progress. So I want to get politicians out of education. But I very much take your point. One of the constitutional changes we could have, which my colleague Graham Brady advocates, is basically taking the executive out of Parliament. But at the moment, we, it, the fact is we have a constitutional system where the executive comes out of the Commons largely with some representatives in the Lords. And most of my colleagues want to be ministers. It's not an ignoble thing to want to do. Um, but it, it's a profound constitutional question, and quite clearly, when you look at people's careers, they are put in places which suit the overall political atmosphere rather than their own personal competences. And sometimes that backfires, although I do support Michael Gove. <laughs> I, I think there's um, a lot of disincentive for professionally qualified people to enter politics. First of all, you have to start at the local government level, where uh, I think I get paid £250 a month for being a Wiccan district councillor. And you have to josh jostle and push your way forward while simultaneously trying to hang on to a professional career where you are registered with a professional association. So you have to behave yourself all the while, otherwise you could be deregistered from your profession. So as you're fighting your way up in politics and trying to hold on to your uh, professional job, I think it's very hard to get to the top or get into Parliament because obviously only a, a tiny percentage of people who stand at each election get into Parliament. But I do agree that people with expertise should be ministers. I would make a wonderful minister for mental health. Vote for me. Moving on. Um, the next question is from Frankie Lowe, who uh, is a Wickham High student. Ooh, that's good. Hello. Um, I was wondering, with an increasing budget on the HS2, do you believe it's still a feasible project, or even ever was a feasible project? And Steve, I thought as you were big on HS2, yeah, well, we'd in, start with you. In this Parliament, I was the first Member of Parliament to call a debate, it was in Westminster Hall, to oppose it, and I stood up and opposed it, and I voted against it. <laughs> Um, at, at one point, a uh, senior member of the government asked me why I, was, why I was voting against it when it wasn't going through Wickham, which I think tells you a lot about the way politics actually operates. But um, I think if we keep investing in things which require subsidy, that is, things which would otherwise be loss-making, we'll make ourselves poorer. So the same argument applied to, for example, the estuary airport that Boris proposed, and I took him to task on that as well. Quite often you hear people arguing, well, we're relying on Victorian infrastructure, forgetting that Victorian infrastructure was mostly the Victorian railways were built by private entrepreneurs risking their own capital, trying to make a profit. And yes, a lot of people lost their shirts, but there's no point us moaning that we're using infrastructure that's lasted 100 years that was built by private entrepreneurs and then doing a state project that actually probably isn't a good idea. The business case is weak. So I will continue to oppose HS2. Yeah. Uh, 
Simon, you're yeah. big on HS2. HS2, I'm a little bit biased on HS2. I live in a little village called Tewestern, and HS2 is going to go basically just <laughs> on the edge of Tewestern in North Buckinghamshire. Uh, but I'm 600 yards from the line, so I'm not going to get any compensation. But my village is blighted, my house is blighted. I won't be able to move for 20 years, but then it'll be all fine. Um, oh, that almost makes me want to vote UKIP. Ah, uh, almost. <laughs> UKIP is the only uh, one of the, the four main parties who are officially opposed to HS2. Um, and the reason is that it's not just people who live in villages like mine uh, who are going to suffer. It's £50 billion. Pounds. I mean, that's a terribly huge amount of money. Uh, originally it was for speed, uh, then it was for capacity. Now, the capacity argument is a really interesting one. Well, we've got two lines already that are really good going up to Birmingham and then up to Manchester. The one out of Euston that goes to Birmingham is a very good line. You guys probably use the one out of uh, Marylebone that goes through, through Bicester. So we've got two lines already. Could we not spend, say, five billion making those two lines quicker, increasing the capacity, surely it's not beyond the will of man to do that. Um, so why not put five billion into that, maybe five billion extra into the road budget, and then 40 billion to sort out this blooming deficit. Wouldn't that be a good idea? Um, I'm, I'm quite intrigued by something I read just recently, which was something that Peter Mandelson said, which is that he said HS2 was kind of an invention uh, kind of contrivance in 2008, 2009 to try to, you know, have something quite glittery to try to win the election and impress people in the north about the north-south divide. We're going to address that. I'm intrigued to know whether that is apocryphal or whether that's absolutely true or not. But uh, anyway, HS2, uh, uh, UKIP is the only party that is officially opposed to HS2, so uh, they deserve your vote. Julia, are you well, pro or you anti? Know, I'm, I'm bursting here now to have a go at UKIP. UKIP is a one-trick pony. It's a one-trick pony on national politics out of Europe, and it's a one-trick po pony in our local Bucks County Council well, it's politics. It's not well, it's got one trick nationally, one trick locally. It's a protest party, which is what the Liberals used yeah. to be. Yeah, so yeah. the... <laughs> it's just a bigger, the, a bigger party. Yeah, it's... it's uh, I, I don't want to no, see the at, coalition at, splintering. At the county, <laughs> at the county I council. In a coalition at the county council. <laughs> <laughs> I, I vote in, with the government more often than the prime minister. <laughs> in, in Buckinghamshire, at Bucks County Council, all the parties, even UKIP and the Lib Dems, agree that we do not want HS2. But personally, the reason I don't want it is because I support Chiltern Railways 100%. They have a brilliant line from Marylebone to Birmingham. I often go on there and I want to support them. Um, also, I resent paying all those billions of pounds out when we've got a housing crisis in Britain today. And I support the uh, notion of uh, new garden cities where people can go and live and have a decent environment. I want the HS2 money to be spent on housing urgently. So Simon, when HS2 comes, is it garden city for you? Got it well. If there was a train station in our village, that'd be fine, but there won't be. So we, we've got. <laughs> Giles, do you do you have a view I on it? I have a strong to... view. It doesn't. Uh, it doesn't personally affect me. I, I must say that I have a slight weakness for these sort of big schemes. Um, I remember the pitiful effect of coming on the Eurostar only a few years back, where it seemed almost as soon as you reached this sceptered isle that you had to get out of the train and onto a donkey and do the last bit, <laughs> which took hours and hours and hours before you reached a sort of temporary halt in Waterloo. And how wonderful it is now that all that's been forgotten and all the Kent farmers and everybody else have finally become quiet again and now we can get from Paris to London in two and a quarter hours. So sometimes I think there is a virtue in these big projects. But as I say, I'm, I'm not really very um, au fait with HS2. Chris. Um, I remember when there were plans to close the Marlborough and Chilton line. Mm. And just imagine what that would have done to uh, Wickham and to much of Buckinghamshire, actually, if it, if it had all, if that had gone awry. So, I, and I used to live, I used to be the, um, the youth chaplain for the Diocese of Peterborough, living in Northampton. Northampton in the 19th century, the good burghers of Northampton refused to have the railway line go through Northampton, which is why Peterborough got it. Um, so Peterborough has prospered, and Northampton, historically, since then, has failed, even though it was a much uh, uh, grander, older market town. 
Um, so I think, look, I think one of the biggest problems Britain faces is that we have an economy that is entirely driven by London and the South East. We have large reaches of the country where there is enormous levels of deprivation, um, lack of work opportunities, and where the economy is not at the moment growing. And I feel that particularly strongly in relation to South Wales. HS2 is going to do, because that's where my constituency is, HS2 is going to do nothing um, for South Wales, though the electrification of the line to Swansea will. Um, and I, so on the whole, my, my kind of instinct is to be in favour of this, because I think where you see other countries like France have managed, and Spain for that matter, have shrunk the country by big rail investment, it has made a difference to um, bringing the whole country forward. And I say that because I just look at high house prices in London and the South East now, which I think are going to rocket again. That does no favours for anybody here, um, other than those who already own their own homes. It does nothing for future generations. I think it does a lot for international investors, um, but I think it, it keeps the whole of the rest of the economy behind. My worry is, um, is about the cost. And, you know, the fair points to be made about this, the, the cost of this compared to other things that we could do. Undoubtedly, there's a housing crisis in the country. Um, one of the best ways to take house prices down would probably be to be significantly investing in housing. But all the same issues about where the route of the rail goes apply to where, to where you build houses as well. So um, uh, one of the things I most dislike in the British sentiment is nimbyism. Now let's uh, take I didn't some. Think that would get a round of applause. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, there. well, I mean, poor, 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 poor Simon's entitled to a bit of not in my backyard. I mean, honestly, um, I'm, I'm still upset for you. Um, now, let's open it up to the uh, to the audience. There's a young man over there, looking very smart in a suit. Looks like the old school tie. Hi. Yeah, school tie. Um, I saw somewhere that it's possible to renovate every national rail line with the uh, same for the same cost um, it would it would be to build HS2 um, how would you respond to that would you say that HS2 would still be a good project or should we um, renovate your uh, national rail lines we've already got it um, Well, I think it would be much better to... Rele you mean all the lines that were closed in the 1960s? Well, I, the ones currently open can be renovated. Um, I, saw, I think I saw on the BBC, it can all be renovated um, for less than the cost of HS2, uh, and there would still be some money left over. Well, I would have thought extending local lines makes more sense than having one big line that goes up the middle. I mean, Chris talked about um, it will be good for the north of England. Isn't it just going to extend the commuter belt for London? Doesn't it mean you're going to be able to live in Birmingham, commute to London more easily? But that might actually Which help think with house prices, you see. That I, I think that's a good thing rather than a bad thing. But it doesn't um, do but, much but, for but, but, I, but I look at the distance. So, so Cardiff is, at, at the moment, two hours' journey from London. Taking it below 150 apparently makes a dramatic difference to whether people feel able to do business in Cardiff. Yeah. I have much greater ambitions for Cardiff and for Birmingham and for Manchester and for Liverpool and for the, all the rest of our country than to be better satellites for London. It, 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 it's wrong. Look, the reason that the country... But that's all we are now. The reason the country is so oriented towards London and the South East is one I've banged on about many times. Between 97 and 2010, as it happens, the money supply in this country tripled from £700 billion to £2.2 trillion. You cannot triple the money supply in 13 years through new lending without profound consequences. It's called the Cantillon effect. You can Google it if you like. But what you find is that economic activity ends up oriented towards the source of the new money. The source of the new money was the financial system, and so we've ended up with unjust levels of wealth inequality, London dominating, the South East dominating, and the financial system and housing dominating. And it's easily explained through our monetary institutions, which is why I bang on about them so much. Unfortunately, it's going to be a long time before that argument is won, but I believe one day it will be. I think we should ask people in the north of England how they would like to spend this money. Um, develop the Chiltern line so that it's slightly more efficient and invest in the North East and the North of England, have some of these garden cities and stop having legas legacy projects for politicians like Lord Adonis. I mean, this is what it is. Politicians like a legacy. And we sh what we should be doing is meeting the needs of people. It doesn't seem to me that this meets the needs when there's crying needs in the NHS, crying needs in housing. This is a vanity project.
Right, I'll take one last question on this point. First hand I saw was a young man over there, with also wearing a tie and a blue shirt. Thank you. Uh, as a mode of transport, rail travel is actually the most economical per person moved. So surely anything which encourages more rail travel is a good thing and takes some of the strain off our notoriously battered road system, even if it is a big, expensive uh, infrastructure project. I should Im imagine there's quite a lot of agreement with that. Yeah. Shall, shall we move Can on I just to... Say one thing? Oh, yes, I, no, I, please, I'll just say about Lord Adonis. I know him quite well. He is the least, despite his name, he's the least vain person I know. <laughs> yeah, well... <clears throat> that was a joke about Adonis. And yeah, no, 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 I was with you, darling. <laughs> Education isn't what it was, is it? <laughs> you can't say Classical that while illusion. we're sitting in my school. <laughs> <laughs> say what I want in your school. <laughs> Um, let's move on to the next question, which is a question from Alexandra Clark, who is also a Wickham High School student. There's a bit oh, of a takeover no. going on here. Um, lots of people are saying that with the recent events in Crimea, that um, if a country were to propose a war on the UK, would we be able to effectively defend ourselves um, if someone were to... Um, propose a war on us due to the d recent defence cuts. And I think this question is mainly for Steve Baker, in a sense that I want to know your stance on the recent defence cuts, seeing as that you were in the Royal Air Force yourself. I think we'll start with you, Steve. Uh, <laughs> so th there's, you know, there's a lot in all of that. Um, what Russia has done in Crimea is clearly absolutely wrong. Um, it's a gross breach of the international rule of law and they ought not to have done it. And we've very quickly forgotten the people of Crimea who just opposed a government. There's a lot to be said about all of that as well. But in terms of defending ourselves, we ought not to forget NATO. And that really the red line for us would be an attack on a NATO country, I would suggest. But these are incredibly serious matters because we're talking about nuclear armed nations. And it's been really surprising to me how many people in Parliament and in the Commentariat have the, the same people who would advocate the strategic nuclear deterrent have been saying if only we had more conventional forces we could do something in Crimea. Well do they support nuclear deterrence or not? Because if they, you know, you, you can see it doesn't add up. So that's one side of that. We're in a fix. Russia has to be deterred. How? Well as it happens the EU is, a, is the way we organise international uh, uh, um, resistance and, and di diplomacy for European nations so we should use it since it's there. Um, but in terms of defending ourselves, we're, we're still a nuclear armed nation. And now that, the only party in Parliament that is against uh, the strategic nuclear deterrent is the Liberal Democrats. Well, probably the Greens as well. But the, of the, the Labour and the Conservative Party are agreed on the, nuclear, the need for the nuclear deterrent. The other thing is when you look at the numbers of it, uh, uh, for aeroplanes in particular that we're buying, it's pretty clear that the unspoken strategy is always to fight with the Americans if we need to fight. We're buying equipment that's interoperable with them, the very best, and uh, not in very large numbers. And that generally is the trajectory of defence policy. But I would say for my own part, I voted for a non-aggressive stance towards Iran. That's kind of come to pass. I voted against the attack on Syria as a rebel. I voted for Libya because it was authorised by the United Nations and it was very clearly defensive, at least at the point it was put to us. Well, I mean, I don't agree with everything Julia said for obvious reasons, not least about the nuclear deterrent, but I am anti-war. And I am anti-war not least because I've served in the armed forces, but because my wife served in the armed forces. And I had to sit at home for three, three times while she went to war. And um, it makes you think twice about how you'd feel and what's worth dying for. And all the time... I'd, all the time we live in a country which has been denied a say at the ballot box peacefully about who governs us, there is a limit to where I'm prepared to send people to die. So, you know, a lot of issues in there, and perhaps on another occasion, I'm glad to talk to you at uh, greater length about them. I first Julia, you're bursting. Oh, I'm bursting. I'm always bursting. Um, I'm, I'm so grateful to Steve for saying that he's anti-war, because I think that's something we've all got to say far more of. You know, it's, it's the means to the end, isn't it, that perhaps we disagree with. And, I mean, I'm no international expert at all. I was astonished by what happened uh, with Crimea. I don't even know much about the region. But the first thing that surprised me 
was the way in which Ukraine and previously Egypt had overthrown their democratically elected governments. Because if we were to assemble 200,000 people outside Downing Street, we wouldn't find it acceptable for the government to be overturned. And I think these democracies do need to perhaps have a shorter length of term so they can get rid of their their governments more quickly if they're dissatisfied. I don't think that was, that was good at all. I also do think if Crimea do want to separate, that providing that had been done by a properly sanctioned referendum in a proper agreed way, then indeed that, 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 that could have taken place. I mean, it seemed to be overwhelming to me whether or not they had Russia on their doorstep, but they did seem to want to separate. So it's all very worrying when these tensions arise. Um, but I'm so pleased to hear Steve Baker say he's anti-war. We've all got to say that far more often. Giles. Giles, you, you are a, a historian. Crimea, Russia walking into Crimea, Germany walking into Austria. Parallels? Well, there never are direct parallels. It all looks very attractive, doesn't it? I mean, Austria in 1938 um, was almost certainly overwhelmingly in favor of a Nazi takeover. The Anschluss had been denied them after the Treaty of Versailles. Um, whatever they said after, and the honeymoon period did not last very long, so even later in 1938, many Austrians would say, well, they're not very nice and they've given all the jobs to the Germans and that sort of thing. But at the very beginning, in March 1938, there was an enormous enthusiasm for the idea of the Anschluss, the merger between the two countries. Let's not forget that. So as a parallel, it can only be used cleverly. And uh, Crimea... It was never part of the Ukraine, as far as I know. It was part of Tartary, and before that, part of Scythia. And if uh, it was in 1954, I believe, that Khrushchev, who was half Ukrainian, had that part of uh, Russia, for administrative reasons, transferred to the Ukraine. So the redrawing of lines, as Julia said, was perhaps a more appropriate system. Now, none of us likes the way that Putin did it and uh, the style of politics, which apparently Nigel Farage admires, but um, that uh, a way that he did it is perhaps more uh, revolting than the fact that he did it, was that the Crimea actually historically has nothing to do with the Ukraine. It was more the manner of his doing it than anything else that was reprehensible. So I would say that we need to fight shy of these sort of, oh, that's just like Germany in 1938, because in fact the parallels don't work. Simon, um, we've seen Mr. Putin effectively take over the Crimea. This is to be admired. <laughs> <laughs> no, absolutely not. It's, uh, it is very sobering what's going on in Crimea at the moment when you look at our own defence budget. And uh, I think it's important that we sort of bear in mind what's going on there. Um, but I, I agree with Julia. When you look at democracies that are being overthrown by people in the street, then that is a very destabilising thing. It's not just in Ukraine, in Egypt, of course, where they had a democratically elected government, which, which is the Muslim Brotherhood, who are now, I believe, 70, 80 of them are sentenced to death, even though they're the democratically elected government that have been overthrown by the army or in Ukraine, it's kind of a street mob. So, mm -hmm. um, so that is, a, that is a, a strange situation. One thing that I do spot is that there you've got Putin with, he's got serious armies in close to the East Ukraine border. We need to negotiate really hard with them. None of us wants to put boots on the ground there, for goodness sake, because Americans don't, nobody in Europe does. Um, but negotiating with Putin, you need to be really, really strong. And I, I'm really struck by the fact that negotiating as Europe, 28 nations, can't actually agree a negotiating stance. So who's Putin talking to? Well, he's not talking to Baroness Ashton, who's supposed to be the foreign minister of Europe. He's um, talking to Angela Merkel, because she is a leader of a sovereign state who has um, a, a lot of interests in common with, the, with Russia. Um, so, so for me, that sort of underlines the idea that if Europe is there to make us safer, actually it's not, because 28 nations can't actually agree on what the stance is with somebody like Putin. Um, yeah, I mean, very impressive that he's still in charge after 14 years in Russia. Um, he's, uh, a lot of that time, the economy did really, really well, but uh, I think... Um, 
Farage has made quite clear repre reprehensible uh, behaviour in Crimea. So, so, Simon, if I understood you correctly, you don't like the idea of the People's Army overthrowing the establishment. Um, Chris. I thought that Simon just said that it was impressive that Putin was still in power. Yes, he did. I, I, I think 14 <laughs> years of a country like that. It's yeah, not a well, you see, I think he's in power because he's a corrupt, um, rotten, uh, thieving, uh, butchering, Legend. murdering dictator. In, in theory, <laughs> in theory, you know, he's changed the constitution so that he can come back again and mix it up with Medvedev and all that kind of stuff. But you, we've got to remember that um, uh, the, uh, um, Alexander Litvinenko was murdered on British soil by the Russian state. Uh, we've got to remember that nearly every independent um, news organisation in Russia has been closed down a long time ago. A uh, uh, journalists have been murdered who criticised Putin and nobody has ever been prosecuted. A, Br uh, a oh, lawyer, God. Sergei Magnitsky, who was working for a British company, Her Hermitage, um, was murdered and we uh, and still nobody has been prosecuted for his murder even though he died in prison um, uh, let alone the people who were involved in the corruption he displayed and Putin himself has personally um, enriched himself to a phenomenal degree I mean Imelda Marcos, Yanukovych and I don't know how many other of these pe uh, and, and Gaddafi yeah. if you put them all together yeah. they wouldn't touch Putin's level of enrichment and, uh, uh, Julia, I'm sorry, I, I thought you sounded horribly naive, dangerously naive about Ukraine. The, the last opinion poll that was, called, that, that, that was done in Crimea before Putin was standing with his um, Kalashnikovs re um, uh, demanding a re referendum showed that only 23% of Crimeans wanted to leave the Ukraine. And the reason why I think that, that um, Russia has behaved particularly badly is because in 1994, quite rightly, the John Major government signed the Budapest Memorandum. Britain, France, um, the United States and Russia guaranteeing the territorial integrity of Ukraine on the understanding that Ukraine would surrender its nuclear weapons. Yeah. They wouldn't have done this if they hadn't surrendered their nuclear weapons. And I'm certain that Putin had this in his mind when the Budapest Memorandum was originally signed. And what is really worrying is, it all seems a long way away, but the chunk of the, the Crimea doesn't touch Russia. To get to Russia, you have to take another swathe of Ukraine and possibly Transnistria as well, which is in another country. Um, so in answer to the question, <laughs> um, I worry that we couldn't protect ourselves properly. Um, I, Chris, think actually the EU, I think the EU has actually coffee. done quite a good job in terms of having a shared Let's policy in relation there. to Putin, much better than I had worried about. But I do worry that the review that was done into our military um, capability in 2010 was just about money and wasn't a real long-term strategic review of our military defence. You know, Mark, they left us with a 30 billion black hole of unfunded projects. It's a disgraceful thing to do to our defence. So for, uh, it's a bit rich for Chris to say that. We've ended up, we're in a right old mess, this country. We are skating on thin ice. We're borrowing 108 billion this year. We will get our deficit down, the amount by which we're overspending, to half what it was by uh, t uh, next year. But you agree with me, basically, about where our strategic defence, don't you, Steve? The, Let's leave aside the we, party politics, but we do agree about the strategic defence. I agree that our country should have a strong, <laughs> peaceful stance yeah. with a strong defence behind and, it. And I, agreed, I disagreed with you about Libya, incidentally. I refused to vote for the Libya... Um, venture because I thought that there was no guarantee that it was going to be better by having a military intervention and I think in the end I'm not, I'm not sure that the whole of the Arab Spring yeah. has quite worked out as we thought. Well there we are, I'm not sure about that either but I've asked, you know, what do you do? You make a decision and it's bloody tough and there you go. We, no. we, you, you know. And like you I voted against a military intervention in Syria because I couldn't see how that was going to sort the situation in Syria. Now look here Chris, you called me naive but nonetheless, I support your view about Russia. They've, knocked, they've <coughs> locked up uh, people like the Pussy Riot pop group. They've locked up Greenpeace. Their stance on LGBT issues is disgraceful. But the, the problem is that if we keep intervening and uh, bringing in United States against Russia again, I mean, I thought for I, some... I'm not no, for no, it. don't interrupt me. That the fact is that <laughs> sometimes, sometimes... People have got to work things out for themselves. And I don't think that what's happened in Crimea is the end. I think it's the beginning 
of a long and difficult journey for the Crimean and the Ukrainian people. And what is going to happen in, crime, uh, in Ukraine? I am hoping that uh, Julia Timoshenko uh, oh, no. oh, will, come come in, the rest. will come in <laughs> no. in alliance. I'm She's, hoping uh, that she will. I think, OK, let's... I um, I, I'm going to have to move on to the next question, but I'm I ju just going to, before we do that, just uh, I thought it was interesting that this, um, r in the last couple of days, Yanukovych, who is the leader who was ousted by the, uh, by the mob, he actually said that losing the Crimea was a tragedy. He was very upset about it and wants it to be reversed, which I thought was quite interesting. Um, I'm afraid because of time, I want to move on to the last question. Uh, and the last question is, well, I don't even have a name. I have a whole department. <laughs> and what am I supposed to do with that? Yes, department. Would you like my name? I'd no? love your name. Okay. Uh, no. Right. <laughs> uh, this is on behalf of the history department. Um, should anti-German uh, anti sentiment and imperialist triumphalism be allowed to play a role in the World War I centenary remembrance? And I think, Giles, that is designed for you. I think it was designed for me. Um, I think we have, actually, I think it, it's refreshing what uh, Richard Evans, the Cambridge Evans, rather than the Oxford Evans, has said about this recently, where having let the ball, uh, the coil, unravel itself a little bit with Max Hastings, etc., he finally said, well, I don't, I'm not impressed by the debate so far. Can we please start with Serbia and Austro-Hungary? Um, it has, uh, up to now, we have become, we have been extraordinarily self-centered about this debate, as if it was all about Britain fighting a war with Germany, where there, was, there were no other people in the war, as far as I can work out. Uh, and I think that um, I can only concur that up to now this has been the most unimpressive debate about the origins of the First World War, which is in the realms of failed diplomatic history, starting with the shooting of an Austrian archduke in Sarajevo, and uh, the inability to come to terms with actually stopping this, this ball from rolling and, uh, and reaching finally that point where war broke out. And it seems to me that an awful lot of people who haven't adequately studied the subject are given a voice to talk about this, and it seems to me rather sad. But that must be partly down to the television authorities and the BBC and the people who they commissioned to talk about it. Well, after that, I'm not sure anyone else wants to say anything. Um, but, uh, Simon, if you're, if you're brave enough. Well, yeah, well, I'm not a historian, so I can't really compete on that level. I mean, I do think that we should mark the anniversary of, of the 100 years of 1914. That. I think we should mark that moment, because out of whatever you think about the, the war, it's respectful of the dead on all sides. Um, so I think that should be marked, and I think it's legitimate to have a debate about the cause of the war, which we seem to be sort of in the middle of. Um, I think there should be that, that debate. Um, as much as anything, we, we don't want a war like that again, and it's legitimate to go back to the beginning and work out how exactly did this terrible tragedy happen. Um, but I don't think uh, the marking of the anniversary should have any sense of triumphalism. Um, so I, I suspect the questioner is sort of erring in, in that direction. Uh, there's nobody mm. really triumphed. It's a complete tragedy, but we shouldn't forget. Well. Julia? Well, I haven't been doing much studying about the First World War, I'm afraid, and I think the best way to show remembrance and respect to those who were killed is to plan never to enter into wars like that again. And um, at, the in, at the moment, currently, I believe the best way of doing that is to stay in Europe. Well, I'm going to do Chris in here. Chris? Um, I have been doing a bit of studying because I've been writing a history of Parliament and the, the first volume is out now and the second volume is out in September. Uh, and, um, and no wonder you knew about the, when people yes, were exactly. paid and what. The, but the second, but it was quite interesting. Uh, I was, I, I've done a chapter in the second book which is just about um, Parliament in the two world wars. 
And, and I think, on the whole, we tend to puff ourselves up and think that we were wonderful and we must have had a wonderful parliament. Actually, in the First World War, parliament was almost completely and utterly irrelevant. Barely any um, element of, of change was brought about by parliamentary intervention, not, not the creation of the coalition, not the change of the coalition. Um, probably the, the Asquith losing the premiership had more to do with the death of his much-beloved son, Raymond, um, which gave an opportunity for Lloyd George and Churchill, the two great dilettantes of the 20th century, um, to, to take over the government. Um, there, there's, there's one tiny element which, which I think did help, which was that one of the early MPs who was killed in active service was a young man called Oswald no, Harold Corley. Um, and he wrote to his father, who had just been made a member of the House of Lords. And because they were both members of Parliament, of the two different houses, their um, letters to each other, he was in Gallipoli and the Dardanelles, his letter to his father was, um, could not be prevented from publication by the government. And so his criticism of the way the Dardanelles campaign had come into being led to some of the changes in the way we ran the war. So it, it's just what fascinates me is how often, and I hope this is what we do do, that the tiny minutiae of war sometimes are far more revealing than the grand sort of landscape that we all got taught um, at school. And um, I, I suppose in the end it leaves me thinking, especially because... Harold Corley was killed, he was an MP, he was killed. Oswald Corley was killed, his brother also an MP, and then the third son was killed in the Second World War. Um, and that just brings home to me the tragedy of the, of, of the whole thing. And that's why in the end, I'm anti-war, but I'm also anti-appeasement. I, 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 I'm not a pacifist, I'm anti-war, but I'm anti-appeasement as well. Steve. Well, I agree very much with your sentiment, and I, for a very important reason, I think that the position, if you take together a, m many of the issues which we've discussed tonight, is extremely serious. The European Union is in a lot of trouble. The euro is in a lot of trouble. You might remember we've still got extremely low interest rates in the UK and the United States, and we've been, we've been print we, we printed a lot of money. The Americans have just slight started tapering it. An awful lot of money is being created to try and prop up the social system that we have. There is a resurgent nationalism, which I detest too. I, I think I'm an internationalist, but just with less state. Um, and in all of this, we should love our country. I love my country. But we should recognise that our countries are all imperfect. And we should recognise that other people are entitled to love their countries too. And all of that somehow needs to be encapsulated in friendship. So there needs to be no jingoism a sense of humility that all of us have countries with imperfect and uh, sometimes wicked records, but that actually we're all entitled to love our countries, and that actually includes the Germans too, because today's German young people are not responsible for the actions of their forebears, and we have to forgive and we have to move forwards, but at the same time we have to remember, particularly as we get forward another 30 years or so, that it is still at the moment within living memory that the entire industrial machine of a state was turned against a people. And in amongst all of that, there is a very narrow path to doing the right thing. And it is crucially important that we follow it. Because in the end, what we need in all of Europe is to go forward in friendship. And I believe we can. So you're, you're, you're getting something of a similar voice uh, from the members of the panel. What about uh, members of the audience who would like to contribute uh, to, to this issue? Yes, gentlemen at the back. Uh, thank you. Um, another member of the history department. Uh, I'd just like to say uh, that I think it's terribly wrong that most people in this country see the origins of the First World War in the prism of the origins of the Second World War. And I think it's great that uh, the BBC and the media are holding uh, debates about this uh, at the moment. So people today, and particularly young people in schools, can have an objective uh, study of how this war started 100 years ago and not just see us as, as those nasty old Germans. And a young, young, the young man there, um, I think I described you as having a T-shirt earlier on. You're uniquely... Oh, he's got a, a, a Union Jack t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. 
um, my personal views on it is that, especially in the First World War, the ordinary British and German soldiers died for the same reasons and probably had more similarities than they did differences r when they were in the trenches fighting against each other. And, and uh, an, uh, an example that they weren't just, you know, nasty Germans is that they, they believed in the same thing of fighting for their country and I think both sides should be honoured for what they did. A, a spirit epitomised by the Christmas Day football match, perhaps. But I, I, there are some other um, strange things, I think. In the First World War, the government used the, the First World War to double the number of ministers um, in Parliament. And then Churchill doubled it again in the Second World War and allowed people to be ambassadors and things like that. So Steve's thing earlier about taking the executive out of Parliament. And the executive grew dramatically in Parliament because, and, and the control over Parliament grew dramatically in the early 20th century because yeah. of the wars. And we ended up with war socialism run by a liberal. To in order, I mean, the war was part of the transformation in the system of ideas which has, in my view, after 100 years, left us in the place we're in today in our country. But there's another weird irony, which is that in the Second World War, they had 39 sessions which were held in secret, um, which had hardly been used previously. There were just six in the First World War. Um, there's a particular irony about this, because after the Second World War, it, and nobody was allowed to report anything that had been said in the Commons. Um, but it's where some of Churchill's big speeches were made. The only person who had a copy of those speeches was Churchill. When it was allowed for them to be published after the Second World War, he made a killing. <laughs> Don't talk about war and killing. Um, <laughs> Now, I'm afraid we're going to have to bring the debate to an end, but I'm sure that you all agree it has been um, wide-ranging and stimulating. If you just think back over what we have discussed this evening, we've discussed independence for Scotland, Europe, public versus private schools, HS2, Crimea, and now World War I. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I would like you to join me in thanking the panel uh, Steve Baker, uh, J J Julia uh, Wassell, um, Giles McDonough, Chris Bryant, uh, and Simon Strutt. Uh, if you would uh, thank them in the usual way, thank you very much. Ne next, next week's uh, question time uh, will be hosted by Mr. Dimbleby, uh, who sent me an urgent message saying, you rubbish, get off. Ha, ha, ha.